America Foundation. Steve Clemens sends his warmest regards, but uh, due to some travel, um, unexpected travel, he's not going to be able to be here with us today. Um, again, my name is Patrick Doherty, and uh, this is um, the third in a series of pre-Annapolis conference briefings uh, put on by the New American Foundation's Middle East Policy Initiative. Um, the briefing today with former Senator Gary Hart and Daniel Levy is called Tilting Towards Annapolis, U.S. Foreign Policy and the Middle East. Uh, the previous events included mapping solutions on Israel-Palestine and a view from a divided Palestine um, where we had international expert Rita Hauser and Palestinian Legislative Council member Mustafa Barghouti. Uh, we're going to begin today with uh, former Senator Gary Hart. Um, he's a distinguished fellow here at the American Strategy Program, um, and we're especially delighted that he flew in all the way from Colorado to be with us today. My arms are tired. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Hart represented Colorado in the U.S. Senate from 1975 to 1987. He served on the Armed Services Committee where he specialized in nuclear arms control and military reform, among many other issues. He is the author of 16 books, including The Fourth Power, uh, a book, an excellent book I can commend to you on uh, the need for a new American grand strategy, um, published in the year 2004. He has a forthcoming monograph um, that will come out under his distinguished fellow uh, moniker that will come out in um, early next year uh, called National Security Strategy 2009 Under the Eagle's Wing. And uh, we're all looking forward to that. Um, he's also the first recipient of the Worth Chair for Environment and Community Development Policy at the Graduate School of Public Affairs at the University of Colorado, Denver, his home state. Um, we also are pleased to have with us our own Daniel Levy. He's a senior fellow and director of the Middle East Policy Initiative here at the New America Foundation. He was the lead Israeli drafter of the Geneva Initiative in Tel Aviv, and he directed policy planning and international efforts at the Geneva Campaign Headquarters in Tel Aviv. He was a senior policy advisor to former Israeli Minister of Justice Yossi Balin, and he was a member of the Israeli delegation to the Taba negotiations with the Palestinians in January 2001 and the Oslo B Agreement from May to September 1995 under Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. Again, today's briefing is entitled Tilting Toward Annapolis, U.S. Foreign Policy in the Middle East, and I'm pleased to introduce Senator Gary Hart. Thank you. Thank you Patrick, thank you very much for the introduction. Actually, it's 17 books. I wrote another one last night. <laughs> <laughs> I told Patrick earlier, I'm going to keep writing books until somebody reads one of them. I am uh, delighted to be back at the New America Foundation, my home, away from home, and um, particularly to be talking about a subject so critical uh, to this nation's interests as well as the world. And I am um, even more delighted to share the platform with Daniel Levy, whom I have come to know over the past number of months. And uh, the more I listen to him and talk with him, uh, the more profoundly uh, uh, I am convinced that he is one of the most knowledgeable people on the subject that we are here to discuss. In my philosophical days, one of my favorite philosophers was Kierkegaard, who wrote a book called Purity of Heart is to Will One Thing. And Daniel, I think, wills peace in the Middle East uh, as much as, if not more than, anyone I've ever met. And at least in Kierkegaard's book, that makes him pure of heart. There is an assumption that I would like to challenge today and that is that there is unlimited time to achieve some sort of settlement, a peace settlement in the Middle East, and that inevitably it is in the control of the United States to determine when and how that occurs, or at the very least 
as someone has said, the United States is the necessary, if not also the sufficient uh, cause of peace in the region. I think for a variety of reasons that I will briefly spell out, that assumption or those assumptions need seriously to be questioned. To put it another way, I think the amount of time that the United States has to play a broker's role or a mediating role or a diplomatic role is finite and that it is in a few years and not uh, a lot of years. Now what are the reasons for questioning the role that the United States can play in this process? I think there are about a half dozen in two different groups. One are the kind of, is one group of two or three reasons have to do with the current situation. We have uh, witnessed seven years of, by and large, of U.S. neglect at leadership and diplomacy. And the current administration in charge of that period of time and responsible for that neglect has, I think, in the short term, gotten by with it. That is to say, there has not been a major conflagration, uh, massive loss of life, or a single event or a series of events to completely destabilize an already unstable situation. But I think few would argue with the proposition that the United States has done very little in front of the scenes or behind the scenes during this period of time. There was a a period of time some years back, 20 years back, when I spent a good deal of time in the region as the guest of heads of state, uh, President Mubarak in Egypt, then Prime Minister uh, Shimon Peres in Israel, and the late King Hussein in Jordan. And at the time in the summer of 1986 that I was there, it became um, evident to me, principally by the late King Hussein, confirmed by former Prime Minister Perez, that discussions were underway, serious back-channel discussions between the two heads of government, heads of state, and that there was a peace agreement ready to be ratified if the United States would play a role in um, guaranteeing that agreement, that is to say, to help underwrite economic development and political stability in Jordan, and to give its support both openly and, and uh, less openly to the effort by Prime Minister Perez. This was um, so startling at the time, and at, up to that point secret, that I returned from the region and went directly to the Department of State. Again, this is July, August of 86. I met with um, Secretary of State Schultz and told him the discussions I'd had, uh, first with King Hussein, then with Prime Minister Perez, and then back to Amman to meet with uh, King Hussein to make sure I had the story straight that I was prepared as a member of the Senate then to help organize a bipartisan coalition in the Congress to give support to the administration in any kind of peace package it was prepared to put together to bring about this uh, remarkable development. And that would have meant following on the Israeli-Egyptian peace agreement that you would have had a, an Israeli-Jordanian peace agreement and I thought I think anyone would have thought under the circumstances that this would be a remarkable development. After laying out the statements made to me by King Hussein and by Prime Minister Perez, and there was some urgency to this because uh, there was a power sharing arrangement in Tel Aviv and uh, Mr. Perez did not have all the time in the world to bring this about. The response I got from then, the then Secretary of State was, we see no advantage to us, being the Ad Reagan administration, in getting involved in the Middle East. Well, of course, uh, time went on and a peace agreement 
was reached five or six years later, as I recall. But there were a precious five or six years that were lost simply because our administration said they saw no particular advantage to them by being involved. It is that attitude that I would like to question and I'd like for you to question here today. My view is that we do not have all the time in the world and that the United States is not at luxury to pick and choose when it will become involved, when it will become active, when it will be willing to pay a price, when it will take a leadership role, and when it will not. This situation of neglect is exacerbated by the war currently going on in Iraq as well. It, in my judgment at least, and I think the judgment of those much more expert than I, has set back, rather than advance the American cause or the peace objective in the region, has set it back considerably. How far back it has, how far back it has set us, set all the parties, only history can say. It's very difficult to know. But it was during that six or seven years of neglect in diplomacy that the war has been taking place in the region. And I think you put the two together and you've got just further destabilization of the situation. And then a third added factor, of course, is the uncertainty about Iran and the seeming desire on the part of some senior policymakers in the current administration to, to uh, encourage uncertainty. The various leaks, the various uh, oblique statements made by senior administration officials up to and including the vice president keep uh, virtually everyone who's concerned with the region and the situation on tiptoes about what is or is not going to transpire. If we want success at Annapolis, and that's what we're really here all to discuss today, it seems to me one way not to achieve that is to leave great uncertainty and to encourage uncertainty in the public and the media about what our intentions there are. It would be very easy for the administration and the president to simply say, uh, we will work with the international community to guarantee or to assure ourselves that Iran will not become a nuclear military power and we will use diplomacy and international cooperation to achieve that collective objective. Although the president comes close to saying that, every time he does, either the <coughs> vice president or someone else drops a suggestion that uh, the military option is still on the table, to use the current um, phrase of choice. So those uncertainties, the neglect of the last seven years, the Iraq war, and the possibility of a wider war in the Middle East makes it difficult, if not impossible, for real progress to be made at the end of this month in Annapolis. I'm sure s many of you saw the New York Times story yesterday already suggesting that the parties uh, to the discussions don't want to call it a, p a conference. Uh, they don't want to leave suggestions that they might lay out some sort of framework or adopt some sort of agenda. And the reasons given for that recalcitrance had to do with domestic politics both in the Palestinian territories and in Israel itself. What I'd like for you also to think about in terms of the U.S. role and the possibility that that role is eroding uh, in the next few years are two or three other factors. First of all, the patience of the American people. By and large, my experience, and I think most of my colleagues then in the Congress or today in the Congress would say that overwhelmingly the American people give to their elected officials, whether in the executive or legislative branch, a great deal of leeway to sort our way through a very complicated situation in the Middle East. And that in meeting with concerned citizens, whether in Colorado or any other state in this country, uh, people are knowledgeable. Certainly people that come to town meetings and public forums, uh, they're knowledgeable 
often extraordinarily so, um, outside this community, about what's going on in the region, what the United States stakes are, and so on. And they are, they're curious, uh, they're often very uh, concerned, deeply concerned, and they're seeking information from their elected officials about what the United States should do or shouldn't do uh, to bring about some sort of resolution, peaceful res resolution. But, and that kind of patience over years and decades has, I think, led policymakers in this town over generations to just believe that patience is uh, eternal. I'd like to question that because, uh, if nothing else, my own personal experience in continuing to speak and, and be engaged in uh, civic discourse with my former constituents and people around the country, I am beginning to see a degree of restlessness. A lot of it triggered by the Iraq War and the th possibility of nuclear, uh, the use of nuclear weapons or the accumulation of nuclear weapons. But I am sensing a degree of, uh, first of all, of uh, impatience and the beginning of a higher degree of frustration among the people that I have talked to and met with than I think most people in this city are aware of. And I would like to suggest that the patience of the American people is not, uh, is not going to last forever. And if that's the case, what options do the voters and the citizens of this country leave their elected officials in this region? Well, it would not be, I would think, to intervene in any way militarily, American people are smart enough to know we can't impose any kind of resolution by force, although we have sought to do so in other venues. It would not be to change policy necessarily or side with um, the Palestinians more than we have or any other interest group uh, or ethnic group. But it certainly would include the option of a high degree of isolation, simply washing our hands of the whole matter and saying, we've tried this and we've tried that and President Clinton tried this and somebody else tried that and all of it seems to fail. These are intransigent, intractable groups, whether on the Israeli or Palestinian side, and in a kind of American colloquialism <coughs> to hell with it. So I would urge people who are in the policymaking arena and people concerned like yourselves to keep in mind that possibility that a series of events, perhaps not any cataclysmic one, but just a series of frustrating events, uh, not least among them of an inconsequential meeting in Annapolis followed by other inconsequential meetings. And the American people would just say, enough, just forget about it, let's just get out of there. Now, I wouldn't rate that possibility high, but I think it's one that all of us ought to keep in mind. A second factor in the American situation is the erosion of our authority, and particularly our moral authority. And that's occurred for a whole variety of reasons. I think there was a weekend story, as I recall, about a number of observers commenting on the American situation in the world. I mean, I think we're all familiar with the Pew survey research and other opinion research that's, that is done outside this country about people's attitudes toward the United States, and there's no question. I think you, I would be amazed if anyone in the White House today questioned the fact that America's standing in the world, it's in the opinion of the people of the world, is at a very, very low ebb. Now, that can be one of two things. It can be one of, one of many things, but it can be one of two things. One is a temporary phenomenon. We finally resolve the Iraqi issue. We bring the troops home sooner or later. Public opinion rises. America does something very grand. People say, well, it's not such a bad country after all. That, I think, is what everybody would like to believe. But 
think about the possibility that a nation, as with an individual, can squander its moral authority. And that may not be recoverable. If we have tempted fate to a degree that we should not have, in the Cold War, for example, by behavior that was not in keeping with our constitutional values and principles, uh, the overthrow of governments, uh, the attempt to assassinate foreign leaders, uh, the gap between what we claimed for ourselves and what we what principles we claim for ourselves in our behavior. If that is now being replicated in the age of terrorism, a kind of cynical disregard for the values we claim to profess, and that is systematic, and people see us as the great hypocrite of the world, then that may be a situation that is not recoverable. Uh, nations great empires, of course, have fallen over time. And they have often done so not just because of internal corruption, but also because they simply did not live up to the standards that they held, uh, held themselves out to the world. I think that our moral authority is eroding, and it could well affect us in the Middle East before anywhere else. Uh, even if the president woke up tomorrow and said, I have a grand plan for peace, not only is Secretary Rice and the vice president going there, but I'm going myself, and I'm not leaving until we get this thing resolved, it might not work. And a final factor that may not be as apparent, but is, is clearly part of this equation, is our dependence on oil from the Persian Gulf. I don't know how much that is discussed here, but I can tell you outside this city, across the country, people are increasingly aware that our conduct in the region has an awful lot to do with our requirement for oil from that region. We have, we are now engaged in a rather long second Gulf War. Neither president uh, or administration who conducted those wars was willing to use the single word oil. But that does not mean that the people of the world do not understand that we import 60 to 70 percent of our oil supplies and that 25 or 30 percent of that comes from that region. So we can go to war there ostensibly for freedom in Kuwait or democracy in Iraq or whatever we say. But I can almost guarantee to you there is not a person outside our borders that does not believe oil has something to do with it. We're simply fooling ourselves. That further contributes to the erosion of our authority and our moral authority and our standing. Our unwillingness or inability to be honest about our intentions and our behavior. And that, I think, further contributes to this shortening of the life of America's ability even if it is dedicated and committed all out to bring about a peaceful result in the region, its ability to cause that to happen. I had an idea some years ago in traveling in the region. I began to meet a generation of young people, mostly men given the cultural circumstances, between let's say 28 and 35, many of them in positions of um, high positions in their society, politically or whatever, the sons of prime ministers and so forth. And the, it turned out they were beginning, this is at the end of the Cold War, the late, uh, late 80s, early 90s, middle, mid 90s. It was, not, it was not unusual to find a young Israeli businessman whose partner was a Jordanian or a Lebanese. And it suddenly dawned on me that uh, we all know even with a large map, you can put a dime on that region and cover Tel Aviv and Beirut and Damascus and Amman. And they were all concerned with building new communications networks, new financial structures, uh, airports, seaports, and so on. But they were smart enough to know that it made no sense in those four capitals to have four separate systems. So it occurred to me you could form in the region, in the private sector, 
uh, international businesses composed of some of these young business people and future leaders to finance common communication systems and transportation systems, regional airports and seaports, and a variety of things that would begin economically <coughs> to draw this region together. And perhaps have the political process follow the economic process, that maybe the way, maybe we were going at this all wrong, that if in an age of globalization and internationalization, if you could bring young business people from that region who didn't want to conduct the old quarrels and didn't want to inherit them from their fathers and grandfathers or great-grandfathers, but simply wanted to get on with their lives and make some money, if you could bring those people together and create regional financial networks and economic projects, that that might be the way to break out of this uh, stalemate. I've not given up on that, although most of those people are now 15 years older. They're becoming <laughs> senior ministers, and they themselves are getting caught up in this uh, age-old quarrel that seems to go on and on and on over there. But it is that kind of thinking that may be a, a way out. And perhaps what we ought to be doing here is not just constantly trying to restart the old engine, but maybe uh, building a new engine totally. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Senator. That was fascinating. Um, we are going to quickly go to Daniel Levy. <coughs> Um, and then uh, I'll ask a question, and then we'll open up to the field. Okay, Daniel. Thanks, Patrick, and I, I, I want to welcome Patrick to, to hosting these events, and he's someone we'll all be seeing a lot more of, and, and we're all very excited about that here at New America Foundation at the America Strategy Program to have you on board. So if I could also use this occasion to formally welcome you and how, how much I'm looking forward to working with you. Um, and thank you for your kind words, um, Senator Hart. And as Patrick said, you came in from Colorado, but part of the deal was not that you were allowed to take us out of our Washington bubble and tell us what was going on in the world outside of here. So you broke the rules there. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> but but uh, actually, there is a message in that, because I think it was and, and I have a tendency, and many of us here, and including in, 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 in the presentations that we've been doing, have this tendency to get deep, burrow so deeply into the weeds of the day-to-day -day of, oh, do you think they can get a statement at Annapolis which talks about a settlement freeze or about a settlement slowdown? And to have someone of, 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 of your experience and, and with your perception to be able to take us up to 30,000 feet and say, okay, here's the big picture, and this is where it fits into the big picture, I think is a very important corrective to so much of the debate that goes on here, and I, and I very much appreciate and valued you doing that for us here today. Um, and I, I really just want to, to respond and, and, and try and carry forward a few of the things that you mentioned. These have been seven lean years. <clears throat> um, I was a negotiator on the Israeli side last time we were in a negotiating process with the Palestinians in January of 2001. So we're literally a couple of months away from it being exactly seven lean years. Uh, I don't think that neglect of the Israeli-Palestinian peace process and of conflict resolution has done anything to stabilize the region, quite the reverse. I also think it's done very little to advance Israeli or American interests, let alone those of our allies and potential allies in the region. And, and maybe my point of departure for looking at this Annapolis conference is, is the story you told. I was in college when you were uh, telling Secretary of State Schultz that you would put together a bipartisan coalition in, in the Senate. Um, what happens immediately afterwards, as you mentioned, Shimon Peres, 1986, is Israeli Prime Minister. He's about to hand over we have a national unity government in Israel at the time of the centre-right party, Likud, and the centre-left party, Labour. And it's, it's not totally unique to Israel. You have something similar in Germany right now. But Shimon Peres, who's having, leading these talks with the Jordanians, knows that there's a deadline where he has to hand over as part of the agreement, as you mentioned, to Shamir. 
Secretary of State Schultz decided not to get behind the agreement. Perez hands over to Shamir. Shimon Perez, being Shimon Perez, continues to conduct secret talks with the Jordanians. And eventually, a full-fledged agreement is worked out between King Hussein and Perez. Perez is now the Deputy Prime Minister. And Perez again goes to Secretary Schultz and says, we've got, we, it was called the London Agreement in 1987. He says, look, we've got an agreement where Israel withdraws from the West Bank and the Jordanians take control and they're on board for it. Now, I don't know whether this would have worked as a solution or not, and there are those who are now suggesting we come back to that kind of arrangement 20 years later. That train well and truly left the station, and I'm certainly not suggesting that there's a Jordanian option today. Schultz said no a second time to Shimon Peres. I'm not going to get behind this. And for me, there, were, there are two things that are being replicated today that one can learn from that story. First of all is getting what I would call getting spooked by Israeli domestic politics. And secondly, the question mark as to whether this is a priority US interest. Had Schultz then have decided it was a priority US interest and therefore he was going to pursue that interest and not be spooked by Israeli domestic politics, there would have been one decision. And today I believe the, the administration is facing exactly the same questions. If, as the Iraq study group suggested, as you've just yourself suggested, the, the people who I consider to be the wise people in this city are constantly suggesting. And I think as the history of the last six or seven years very, very, very firmly tells us that allowing this conflict to fester only erodes America's image and power in the region is a gift to radicals in the region who are trying to mobilize and are given such an easy terrain on which to mobilize people against the US. If this discourages people from wanting to publicly ally with the US, and I believe it does all of the above, then this has to be a vital US interest. If that's the case, and I think that debate is going on inside the administration, I think Secretary Rice is now of the opinion that this is important and that this is a genuine effort on her part. If that's the case, you don't get spooked by Israeli domestic politics. What you're about to see in Annapolis is another example of the Americans having set a certain goal. The Israeli domestic political equation having found that goal inconvenient, an American retreat in the face of very limited pushback on the Israeli side. I believe you have an Israeli Prime Minister today who, if he felt he really had to confront the moment of truth, may well come out on the side of, okay, I'm willing to go forward with a far-reaching agreement with the Palestinians. If he can convince the Americans, give me more political time, not now, let's have an Annapolis conference that paints a very general picture that doesn't actually set out a framework for a deal, we can continue to have negotiations for several months, then any politician under normal circumstances will say, well, you know what, that's more convenient. Then I don't have to confront uh, what could be a very tricky uh, political obstacle. And I think that's what's happened um, in, the current, uh, in the current round of talks leading up to Annapolis and what will be borne out at, at Annapolis. Now, I think there is still the question of the US political will, although I would, I would suggest that, that Secretary Rice is interested in moving this forward. I don't think that's a view shared uh, across the administration. But unfortunately, one has to uh, ask the, the other question which you raised in, uh, in your comments, Senator Hart, which is political skill. If there were a decision, if there is a decision at Annapolis, if there is a decision after Annapolis, then is there the ability in terms of carrying capacity to actually deliver on a meaningful peace process that can deliver results? Now, you mentioned two things, which are domestic impatience and frustration, and the international erosion, 
if I paraphrase you, I would, I would argue that you're saying the international erosion of both American hard power and soft power in many ways. Because the embroilment in, in Iraq, I think, certainly makes others in the region feel more secure that no one's about to go after them any day now because of that uh, situation that the US faces in Iraq. Now, if you're right, and I think there's a lot to what you're saying on domestic impatience and erosion internationally of the US, then I, coming from where I'm coming from, immediately ask the question, well, what are the implications of that for Israel? What are the implications of that for Israel and for Israel's supporters? One response can be, well, that's very threatening and very dangerous. So let's button down the hatchets, hunker down and maintain as much control as we can of the situation so that if indeed out in the heartland there's impatience with this and people say, well, actually, this is a tribal war. They've been killing each other for thousands of years. They'll carry on killing each other for thousands of years. Why are we bothering ourselves with this? Then make sure that that doesn't seep through into Washington and the way in which American interest group politics work plays out gives, uh, you know, gives groups any number of, of ways of trying to make sure that even if something is going on out there, it affects Washington in the most minimal way. However, my fear is um, that that's not going to help. And so if I were looking at this from an Israeli interest perspective and the supporters of Israel, I would say, if indeed there is an erosion going on, and I think that's what we're seeing, then there's an imperative here. And the imperative is, while American power is still sufficient to deliver a deal in the Middle East in which Israel is able to realize agreed, recognized borders with its neighbors, that America can help secure that deal, that before there's too much erosion of American power, if I'm looking at this from a purely selfish Israeli interest, I would be saying to myself, how do I encourage them to do as much as possible, as fast as possible, because if America either goes down an isolationist track, which I think we may still be some way off from, although the Ron Paul phenomenon is interesting here. It's interesting that the one campaign that's, that's capturing the imagination of an otherwise really downbeat Republican base is the campaign that's essentially uh, an isolationist message. So even if we're some way off, if there is an isolationist trend going on here, if there is an erosion of American power, then if I'm a clear thinking Israeli strategist, I'll be saying, OK, if there's still a chance now to have Arab acceptance and recognition of Israel in borders that are not borders of occupation, and if I understand that one day I'm going to have to confront this question, I should be doing it today rather than kicking this can further down the road. In that respect, Annapolis may well play a, a, a negative role. Uh, and the way in which Annapolis may play a negative role is it could feed further <coughs> into what you've just described as a frustration, an impatience, a why do we bother investing in this diplomatically? We can't deliver anyway. My, one of my major concerns with Annapolis, with the idea of bringing together a major international conference, having the Secretary of State shuttle, which in a way she's been doing, uh, back and forth to the region, and for that conference then not to deliver anything big, is that you've deployed one of the most significant tools that you could deploy as the world power of the United States. And if that tool doesn't deliver something big, then people further erode their own belief that, this, that, that either America can deliver the goods or that this is worth America <coughs> investing in. So my concern here is that you kind of have this, well, towards the end of each two-term administration, you have a last desperate grab at Israeli-Palestinian peace. It doesn't deliver very much, but what can you do? That's what American... Uh, American diplomacy is, is up for at the moment. Um, and, and that's my fear regarding Annapolis. I'll, I'll end my remarks by saying the following, um, that I think one of the other effects of this erosion of both American hard and soft power in the region, which I think is a phenomenon that's, that's, that's there, 
that does exist now is I think the US will have to be more inclusive of the actors that it includes, of the actors that it brings in to any process, and of their interests. In other words, I do not think today, and I'm not sure that it was ever possible, but I do not think today that a, that a, a Pax Americana, which is imposed on a set of reluctant actors and says, OK, Syria, unless you change your regime, you're out of this. Palestinians, Hamas, you've got no role in this whatsoever. I'd even say Iran. We're, all, we're doing all of this to build a solid alliance against you. Either you change your regime, you totally get naked and agree with what we want, or you're not part of this either. I think there's going to be, have to be a much more inclusive approach. My colleague here at New America, Flint Leverett, uh, and I recommend this to, uh, to, to people to read, has, has, has well, he actually testified last week before a House uh, subcommittee on what a grand bargain with Iran might look like. And uh, that testimony can be easily accessed through Steve Clemens's uh, blog, The Washington Note. Um, and I, I, would, I would say that's the kind of direction we're going to have to be looking at going in. I would almost be tempted to say you can't fix anything in the region now until you fix everything. It's easier to do an Israeli-Palestinian peace process if you're more inclusive, if you've got the Syrians on board, if you take a more nuanced approach to political Islam, even if you're trying to reach out and get an agreement with Iran over them not being a spoiler, rather than trying to browbeat Iran into not being a spoiler. Uh, on the Iran question, I, I think all that is particularly significant as Iran en enters a parliamentary followed by presidential election cycle um, in 08 and 09. So those would be my, my thoughts feeding off um, the, the tremendous sustenance for thought that you presented to us, Senator Hart. Thank you. Thanks to both Dan Levy and Senator Hart. It's a fascinating time to have these conversations um, in a time when Washington, I think, is a bit more cynical about Middle East peace processes. Uh, New America has been able to have some very fascinating and very, very much needed conversation and dialogue about uh, the prospects uh, for the Annapolis Conference. And this is, I think, keeping pace with our others. Um, what I'd like to do is first ask uh, each of our speakers a question and then open it up to the floor. Senator Hart, I think um, another assumption out there, perhaps with um, uh, running through the Democratic campaigns, is that to a certain extent the next American president um, will be granted a do-over in the international affairs, simply by virtue of a change in partisan control of the White House. They will have an opportunity to um, right things. To what extent do you see that as true, and to what extent do you think that things have changed so substantially that that is not true? Well, I think the honeymoon, the shorthand usually used, still exists. It's probably shorter given the nature of the times in which we live. Um, if in peaceful times, presidents have quite a long period of a year or two, perhaps, to make their mark on international relations or to launch new initiatives. I think in the last 10 or 15 years, for a whole variety of reasons, uh, we're living in a, a, a sh certainly a much shorter news cycle. Uh, we're living in a world where results have to be seen tomorrow. Uh, it's true in the private sector as well as the uh, public sector. So pick a date, pick a, a length of time, six months, 18 months. I'll tell you a story that kind of illustrates it. The pattern in American presidencies as all of you know, is the presidents come in, they, they run on a domestic agenda. They come in with a, uh, a set of domestic priorities. I think clearly in this, in this round, health care will be among those, perhaps climate change, one or two other things, education, environment. They achieve, they either are ground down and win nothing, uh, the first Clinton health care initiative, 
or they achieve modest success and then get into a kind of um, uh, period of uncertainty where very little more can be done and then they turn to foreign policy and begin to preoccupy themselves with in the old days discussions with the former Soviet Union perhaps the Middle East or whatever I was um, some of you here are too young to remember uh, national candidate some years back and in the same period of 86 I had gotten to know uh, not only leaders in the Middle East but I'd gotten to know Mikhail Gorbachev and at the end of his first full year in office and had formed an opinion very strong opinion that he was uh, that the Cold War was over uh, whether however you attribute whether you give the credit to uh, Ronald Reagan or Star Wars or whatever he had decided and those around him had decided to reinvest in their country and try to rebuild up the Soviet economy so I had a plan in mind, if I had been successful in 1988, to reverse the tr tradition in American presidencies and um, if elected to uh, quietly discuss with uh, President Gorbachev uh, a grand bargain between the U.S. and the Soviet Union to end the Cold War, dramatically reduce nuclear weapons, open up trade, welcome Russia into the West, and a, and a pretty comprehensive set of agreements and if he had behind the scenes back channel agreed to this invite him <laughs> to the inauguration in Washington in 1989 it would have been a dramatic gesture and we would have used that occasion uh, to end the Cold War formally I had occasion to talk to him about that probably in the mid 90s and told him what I had in mind and I asked if if we had if I had been successful what would have been his response? He said, uh, I would have agreed completely. And he said, I would have welcomed, <laughs> I would have been very happy to attend your inaugural. My idea then was that if that were successful, I would have a sufficient political capital to then personally go to the Middle East and try to resolve that as quickly as possible with a comprehensive American sponsored plan. Uh, and and make offers to both sides that they could not refuse and if I had then been able to successfully resolve that situation to then come back and address the domestic needs of the country the transition from uh, manufacturing to an information economy regearing our education system and a whole whole variety of domestic agendas but uh, that was not to be it, perhaps the next president might think about something like that. Um, whether that individual is prepared to do so, I have no way of knowing, but it might be a good question for somebody here to ask uh, each of the candidates. What would be, what are, what are the initiatives you would offer in the first six months of your administration? And might be, uh, we might get some interesting responses. I don't have to really worry about the threat of seeming like Trent Lott by saying that I think uh, if you had been elected we would have been in a better place. Um, if anybody's getting that reference uh, to the de now deposed majority leader. Um, Daniel, uh, I want to drill down more into the, uh, into the Israeli-Palestinian dispute, specifically the American um, position here. We had a great event last week um, with yourself, Chaif Alamari and uh, Flint Leverett, in which, um, it, from, from what Flint was saying, it seemed like the mood in the White House was more in supporting the line of Likud than the Kadima of Omert. And that Omert, there was a little bit of, there's a, some space developing between the White House and the Prime Minister in Israel. And to the extent that that is true, well, is that true? Where, where do we stand on that? And then what does that mean in terms of the efficacy of the Amer any, any American mediation? Um, is there potentially a better third party out there in terms of getting an agreement? And to what extent do you think it's possible to move, will it take an election to move the White House off of that position? I, I don't think the administration is, is, is of one voice on this issue. Um, I think there are competing trends 
uh, within the administration. There's been a strong neoconservative um, driven ideological propensity to to this administration and they have their vision of the Middle East it's a it's a transformationist agenda of uh, of regime change of use of hard power and for some at least of, of making this all much more uh, convenient for Israel uh, the one thing we can say with certainty is that uh, it certainly hasn't uh, changed uh, to Israel's favor or to that of the, the, the US. I think the neocon grip has been loosened but is not non-existent uh, on the administration today. What my colleague Flint Leverett claimed, uh, and, and it's difficult to refute this, um, is as follows, <clears throat> that in 2003 there was a, a serious discussion, 2002-2003, when a document was put on the table called the Roadmap, which was uh, a document that was put down for the Israelis and Palestinians as to how one might get from a situation of, of, of really dreadful violence, where both sides had deep insecurity, to a, back to a, a peace process that would actually lead to a viable two-state solution. And the argument then was, as part of this effort, would America lay out some clarity on the parameters for resolving Isra the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. In other words, not just to say two-state solution, but to say to both sides, this is where we expect this all to end. Because it's, it's one of the worst kept secrets in international diplomacy. If there's ever going to be a two-state solution, we really know what it will look like. It's got to be the 67 borders with minor mutual modifications, etc. People can go to the Geneva Initiative website or my blog or Prospects for Peace or other places to get that. And that discussion took place. And there was a clear majority then inside the administration not to put out these parameters. It would be politically sticky within the American domestic political equation, including within the Republican Party especially when there's a strong evangelical Christian, very right wing on Israel issues base. And the decision was made not to do that. Also not to go against the Israeli government of the day, then led by someone significantly to the right, I think, of the current Prime Minister, uh, Sharon. Flint's claim, Flint Leverett's claim, was that today that balance of power is still sufficiently on the side of those who will recoil from putting out those parameters. One has to say, in the context of the current conference, he's right. It seems that America will not put parameters on the table. Whether that will remain the case in the next 12 months, I think this is one of the last challenges or options for Secretary Rice to, to come out of, of this entire episode of her serving in such senior office uh, with some kind of dignity, if I may say so. I, I doubt it will happen, but, uh, but the, I think it's, it's enough of an open question to at least bear, bear discussing. Um, my argument would be that such an effort would have a tremendously liberating effect on the domestic debate inside Israel. If a U.S. administration, uh, you know, this is our great friend, were to actually put out there what many Israelis inside know and even accept is going to happen. And in the polls, consistently, you have a majority in favor. If that were to happen, then the Israelis would understand, OK, really, really, we have no choice. Uh, and really, we, I always compare it to something in our personal life. When, when, when you, you know you have to do something, but you know it's going to be unpleasant and painful, and there's going to be a long recovery period, you know you've got to do it. But you know what? If you can put it off, then just put it off is a quite human response. And I think that's the same way that the Israelis often view the territories. Uh, of course, it would have a very significant impact on the Palestinian side um, as well. And just to, to, to segue very briefly into the, uh, the, and what a next administration might do, or how would they be viewed in the world, um, I think they will be given, I think a, a new president will be given a lot of uh, an extended honeymoon period. Um, but the question is, do, are, are we on cruise control, kind of autopilot, or is there a real change 
in the way in the way people view things. You know, you can damp down the rhetoric on Iran, but still think that sanctions is the same as diplomacy, or sanctions is the only tool in your diplomatic arsenal. I'm sorry, sanctions, diplomacy does not begin and end with sanctions. You can say that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is really important to resolve. It, it, it's the cause of so much angst and anti-Americanism in the region, and you can appoint an envoy, or you can actually have, an, have a policy that says we're actually going to resolve this conflict. So I think the question is, are we going to be on, a, on an autopilot that just sounds softer to our ears, or are we going to be on a, on a track that says, OK, there are unresolved conflicts that deeply affect American interests, that deeply destabilize the region. We're going to have a new diplomatic surge. And, and I think we'll be able to tell the difference. Great. And on that note, I'd like to open it up, sir, in the back. Uh, yes. Uh, given, given the emphasis on, of the both speakers on the... Uh, if you could identify yourself. Yes. Mike Hager, Education for Employment Thank Foundation. You, sir. We work uh, in the Middle East. Uh, given, given the emphasis that both speakers placed on the neglect for seven years, my question is, why Annapolis? Why now? What is the interest of each of the parties to have this, this event, conference or meeting or whatever it is, now? And what are they going to gain for it? You've got two weak uh, parties, uh, presumably, with the leadership in both Israel and Palestine. You have a president who's in his last year. What are, the, what are they seeking? Is this just, a, a, as some people say, a facade for an anti-Iran coalition? I'd like to hear what the speakers say. I think Daniel's view on this is much will be much more authoritative than mine. My guess is, and it's pure guess, from uh, 1,500 miles away. I, I have both the advantage and disadvantage of living where I live. Uh, I have a somewhat clearer perspective but less information. And maybe that's why I have a clearer perspective. <laughs> uh, I think it's a, well, I struggle all through my life to avoid being cynical, but I think it's an effort by the, at least by the Secretary of State to salvage something. I think Daniel has said that. Uh, I think uh, there is a certain pattern here, as you know, Senator, uh, President Clinton turned to the Middle East late in his second term, uh, came reasonably close to a, a, a bargain, if not a grand bargain, and uh, history will assess whose fault that was, that it didn't work. But there does seem to be an effort, as things begin to wind down, to um, return to this trouble spot. Again, for, throughout most of my adult life, the two dominant issues were Cold War, East-West, U.S.-Soviet, and the Middle East. And one of those is gone. So you've got the last one remaining, and and then finally, again, without being too cynical, there is this kind of changes the subject from Iraq, and it's in the region, and it can be seen as an effort to achieve something positive, even while a war is going on, uh, and and at the same time distract people from the war. But I hope that's not the reason. Daniel. I, I hope I'm not supposed to add the non-cynical take. Uh, <laughs> no, I, have, I have very little t to add. I, you know, what, what was listed so far, Iran, divert attention, uh, legacy questions. And, and I think a degree of uh, encouragement from the parties is the only thing I would add. Is uh, On the Palestinian side, you have a divided Palestinian body politic where one side Basically, the, the historic deal was for Fatah, for the president of the Palestinian Authority, Abbas's party, was to, uh, to say, OK, if we pursue negotiations and if we're close to America and we, and we deal with the Israelis, you're going to deliver Palestinian statehood for us. So it's Fatah trying to cling to something that, 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 that all of us have failed to deliver for them against the other side, Hamas, when kind of that train left the station already, and I don't see how you do it with a divided Palestine. And an Israeli prime minister is looking to rehabilitate himself with a, with a diplomatic process, which is better than rehabilitating yourself with a war. But, uh, okay. Another question, sir. Um, so question for Senator Hart. Um, you can identify for, yourself. Oh, David Wallace with Edelman Public Relations. Voted for him in the 84 primary. Thank you very uh, much. And read, two, and read two of your books, so you don't have to you can stop if you want. Uh, I, can, <laughs> I can quit writing them. Thank you very please much. Please don't. Please don't. My, uh, my question is, uh, you 
uh, one of your assumptions is your concerns are that um, the constituency for Middle East peace will be lost within the United States if we keep trying to keep failing. But as long as there's an APEC organization, as long as an OPEC organization that controls uh, so much more oil, won't there always be a constituency for Middle East peace and stability in the region? Um, no, because our leaders refuse to connect those two dots. And we are led to believe, and I think probably most Americans probably do believe, one is one thing and the other is the other, and the two are not connected. I mean, you cannot, if you can lead the country to war twice in that region and never mention the word oil, uh, you believe you can fool the American people about anything, I suppose, given the circumstances. So um, we're there. Uh, American casualties are over 30,000. It's not 3,850. Go back and read the definition of casualty. It is killed and wounded in combat. So American casualties in this war are over 30,000. Oil has something to do with it. Whether there is a dot between the invasion of Iraq and some bizarre thought that maybe this will lead to, quote, peace, uh, where Israel is concerned, I don't know, because no one is willing to say that openly. But um, I think the American people are going to figure out sooner or later that the um, energy policy we have, and we do have one, is immoral. And it's immoral because our policy is to continue to rely on oil from that region to fuel energy inefficient vehicles, and if the oil gets cut off, to sacrifice the lives of our sons and daughters for the oil. That's our policy. We just don't admit it. And if you force the American people to confront that policy, then they may begin to change their mind about our entire situation there. Thank you. Sir. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Dave Wood from the Baltimore Sun. Uh, Mr. Levy, could you help me understand, I've been sort of mesmerized with Iraq for a while and not completely caught up to date, but you seem to be suggesting that if the United States somehow spelled out what I think you're talking about, the final solution, uh, then... Parameters. Parameters, <laughs> settlement, whatever the term is. Um, then it would sort of magically unlock this whole thing and it could be resolved pretty simply. Israelis would see, oh, that's what we got to do. Okay, we'll do that. Palestinians would be delighted and the thing would be resolved. Uh, I think I must be missing something. No, I, I, my point of departure would be the following. The path that we have been pursuing for most of the what's known as the Oslo peace process since the early 90s, certainly for most of the past decade, has been that you can resolve this conflict gradually through incremental steps, through building confidence, and through putting off for a, to a more propitious moment the issues of borders, Jerusalem, refugees, where this all ends. I don't see how you can construct an argument for the former, for, the, for that business as usual approach anymore. The situation on the ground only deteriorates in terms of uh, settlement expansion, in terms of the realities on the ground. The situation only deteriorates in terms of the security for both Israelis and Palestinians. The situation only deteriorates in terms of the belief amongst the respective publics that you can actually do this, that you can you know, come to a resolution with the other side. So you have this contradictory dynamic of, on the one hand, people are increasingly cognizant of where this has to end. On the other hand, they increasingly don't believe we can get there because of the experience of a failed peace process. Now, you have to break that equation somehow. You have to change that dynamic somehow. Ideally, you have Israeli and Palestinian leaderships <coughs> who could do what Rabin and Arafat did. I don't think you have a Rabin on the Israeli side, and I don't think you have an Arafat on the, on the Palestinian side. In the absence of those, actors, and if one accepts the 
gradualism can't work and if one also accepts that unilateralism can't work that Israel can't just decide okay this is where we want to be this is where we don't want to be we'll leave the places we don't want to be and you Palestinians you can just deal with it and pick up the pieces if one accepts that you need a two-state solution that's going to in some way reflect what is broadly acceptable on both sides and is going to give dignity to both people both people the tiebreaker that most people would say could make a real difference now and could encourage both sides to for, face a moment of truth would be an American, or I would prefer, quartet, which is the Americans, the Russians, the EU, and the UN, a quartet tabled. Actually, tabled means something else in English to America? <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, I just, someone keeps reminding me of that every time I do that. That they would put out with clarity parameters for, for an Israeli-Palestinian peace deal perhaps they'd be endorsed by the Security Council of the UN they'd have to be the right parameters I'm not saying that the morning after everyone goes oh that's what we need to do fine sorry um, what, what I am suggesting is that, that that could set in place a dynamic you still have to address questions of how do you reunite the Palestinian body politic how do you create this kind of security guarantees that's going to allow Israel the comfort level to actually withdraw to those borders but that it's a missing ingredient that hasn't been deployed and there are a few other ingredients right now that could probably bring about the kind of tiebreaker moment that's needed what was devastating about the New York Times article yesterday was that behind the scenes or unofficially or whatever leak both sides said they're not gonna they are too divided at home to make any progress well that's a question the Secretary of State should have asked each side. If you come to Annapolis, is the, can you negotiate? And if the answer was no, then you shouldn't have the... My argument is you shouldn't have the meeting, just to have a meeting. And to give some, you know, press uh, notion that the administration is trying to achieve peace in the Middle East. Because one a series of failures, or a series of inconsequential meetings, feeds the phenomenon that I was trying to comment on, and that is the impatient, the increasing impatience of the American people toward this whole thing. So it's cynical, it seems to me. The Secretary of State or anyone else knows nothing is going to be achieved to go through the charade. It's counterproductive. It's not free. It costs something. Okay, in the back. This will be the last question. Daniel, um, Jim. Given, given what uh, what the senator just said, the first question that was asked, and some of the themes that have been uh, developing throughout the entire conversation, what concerns me most is that this was set up for failure from the beginning. It cannot work and that the consequences of not working are not such at this point that we get a, a, a second try even in, in another administration. That the dynamic that is in place now, both because of neglect and sins of commission on the part of the administration, is such that the beneficiaries of this are, are going to be guys who don't give us a second chance. And, and Senator, I really have to take issue on the oil question. I wasn't going to raise it, it was a tangent in your initial comments. But the way you frame it, I think, is part of a very destructive discourse that's taking place in America right now, where the biggest applause line you get is, and our dependence on air oil, or dictator oil, or Saudi oil. There is, in fact, an interdependence that we have with that region on that resource. And we cannot wean ourselves from it, even though they would like us to, because frankly, our factory is China. Our IT center is India. They are the two fastest growing areas of the use of that resource. And combined with Europe, we live in an interdependent world and have to figure out a way to make this work for all of us rather than see that resource as an evil. It is environmentally a problem, I agree with you, but the taint of Arab and oil, I think, raises some very racist notions in our political discourse that I find very troubling and I don't find it contributing to a solution. Daniel, you should take it first. Yeah, I, uh, first of all, obviously, Jim, 
you and I will, will, even if Annapolis doesn't work and creates the worst conditions possible for the rest of this administration in the next one, we'll, we'll be working to try and reverse that and, and, and create a different reality. And I take the opportunity to commend, uh, really, J Jim Zogby and what the Arab American Institute is doing in terms of trying to, to move a debate even in the impossible waters of uh, presidential campaigns uh, on these issues. And, and I, I think it's, it has a very, very helpful role. Um, Look, I, I'm worried that, that, that this, it, you could now describe Annapolis as an obstacle we have to overcome. <coughs> really, you could say, in many ways, I think a lot of the emphasis of Annapolis now is how do we get to the other side of this bloody meeting that we have to convene with limited, minimal damage to the current Palestinian leadership, minimal damage to the current Israeli leadership, and with the option of a peace process to still be in play. I almost think that's where we're at. Maybe that dynamic can change in the next two weeks. I don't see it happening. Maybe the Syrians will attend, which may end up being the headline. Um, I'm also not sure that that will happen. Um, I would say, though, Jim, that even if the end product of Annapolis is to strengthen precisely the forces on both sides that Annapolis was designed to, to weaken, hardliners in Israel, hardliners on the Palestinian side. Personally, I'm not quaking in my boots at Netanyahu, who's the Israeli opposition leader. We, people have been using Netanyahu as the boogeyman. If, ooh, ooh, if you push us too far on peace now, you'll get Netanyahu. Well, I don't want to say bring him on, but you know, there was a Netanyahu premiership in the past. He was, he was defeated within two and a half years, and you had a new chance. So. By the way, the Labour Party leader ain't much better at the moment. So I'm not, I'm not welcoming the idea of Netanyahu being strengthened, but I don't think that's the only possible outcome of, of, of Annapolis. And if Annapolis leads to us saying, well, maybe we have to deal with the whole internal Palestinian equation and take a more nuanced approach to political Islamists, then again, it's, it's not the ideal outcome, but it wouldn't be a, a dreadful byproduct. Um, yeah. I, I think you're right. I think this is this is a, a, an ill-conceived and, and uh, an ill-prepared summit. Um, if indeed what you see is 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 gradual slippage in terms of the Israeli-Palestinian issue over the next 12 months, I think our challenge is to put it back on the agenda. I think the way you try and do that, in in following on from you what you said, Senator Hart, is is by trying to connect the dots. Um, I don't think there's been enough of a debate in this country at how the Iraq issue, the other Middle East issues, the Iran issue are interrelated. It's not that Israel-Palestine is a panacea and if you solve that then the Iranians become pussycats and the Iraqi Shias and Sunnis say, okay, we'll make peace. Obviously not. But they're all interconnected and I think our effort would have to be to connect the dots uh, in that respect and I'm, I'm, I'm surprised if you disagree. <laughs> Senator, uh, summarize the last part of the question. Uh, it was uh, talking about your connecting the oil, uh, our oil dependence, to the israeli Palestinian situation. Well, it just compromises. Our, our energy policy cannot be separated from our foreign policy in the region. Even though we pretend they are two different projects, they're not. You cannot be importing the amount of oil that we import and a substantial portion of that coming from that region and pretend that has nothing to do with our foreign policy. It's crazy. It's crazy. And yet that's what we're trying to, our leaders are trying to convince, convince us up by their silence. But nobody outside this country believes it. So it's delusional. It's self-delusional. We're not deluding anybody but ourselves. And that's what's so frustrating is, I don't, I don't think there's any hope for any policy that you can't be honest about. And the first step toward uh, sobriety of the 12 steps is, is be candid. Put the, put the chips on the table. I'm a drunk. I'm an alcoholic. I'm just happy to be drinking petroleum. That's step number one. Everybody says, oh, yeah, well, we knew that. Just take the first part of the sentence for the website. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I heard the click go off after I said I'm a drunk. 
know, I just, it's, it's so frustrating because um, the gap between what we, how we see ourselves and how everyone else sees us. Now, I, given this kind of audience, I assume everybody here travels and has been, uh, you know, at other places in the world. And that's all you have to do to realize the gap between our self-image and other people's image. And that's why we're so in the toilet now in terms of public opinion. It's because we've got this grand vision of ourselves and patting ourselves on the back because of such good people we are. And everybody says, are these people crazy? Are they, why can't they be honest with themselves? You know, it is, it, I, I don't like to keep coming back to the same Im image, but it is like having an alcoholic in the family. You, you, and nobody mentions the alcoholism, even as the drinks go down. But, but in the Middle East, it's interesting that the other half of the equation, in the Middle East, it's the other half of the equation that the, that the questioner here raised that is viewed as the, the sort of the, if you want to use the alcohol metaphor, uh, that is the source of the, of the drinking problem. And that is the APEC, as they perceive it, the APEC money in politics that drives the policy. The point is, is that if you're going to be fair about it, look at both parts of it, but the fact is, is that the Arab oil has not distorted the policy toward the Israeli-Palestinian question. To the contrary, we've actually ignored that interest as we've pursued the Israeli-Palestinian issue and not acted in accordance with that interest. I'm sorry, I just don't see the connection. Okay, I think we can maybe take this offline, Jim, if you can come sure. up and we'll have the, continue the chat offline. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, this is a great uh, event. I'd like to thank our speakers again, Gary Hart and Daniel Levy. Thank you for coming and check the website for future events.